In 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 15, Paul just does so many interesting things with language and there's so much richness in his ideas and metaphors, there just wasn't time to cover even most of it on the Lord's day. So we're gonna take another look at the passage and look at some of what's going on in it today on Beyond the Notes. Clay pots are the, are the single most commonly discovered archaeological artifact on archaeological digs all over the world. Pretty much every civilization that left traces of itself behind for archaeologists to find and dig up used clay pots for storage. Uh, the shapes can be different the level of ornamentation and, and means of ornamentation, sometimes pigment, sometimes rudimentary engraving. But the clay pot itself, a, a commonly available material like clay made from the soil of whatever part of the world we're in, a common material sealed and used to contain things from clean water and food to, uh, you know, not so clean water, to common household stuff. Clay pots are just commonplace. They, they are, they are, they are everywhere archeologically, which means they were everywhere in uh, different times and places long past. So for Paul to grab that metaphor, jars of clay, clay pots, um, and describe us, uh, believers as those who bear the treasure of the gospel in the clay pots of our lives, nobody in his readership would have missed the point that the clay pot is a common everyday thing, fragile, disposable, of no real particular value. We're not talking high-end ceramics here. We're talking everyday uh, useful vessels. And I want to I want to look at and again if you were not at McGregor this last Lord's Day then I want to encourage you go back and have a look at the message because this week especially going beyond the notes assumes you were tracking with us for the message but uh, I want to look a little bit more at this this pair of uh, these four pairs of opposing things in verses eight and nine we are afflicted in every way but not crushed perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. And he's already told us why these things are permitted to happen. He sets that up in verse seven when he says that this is to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. That what's going on in our lives as followers of Christ is overwhelmingly, mostly, uh, is, is, it's a God thing. It's not a me thing. And having already described us as jars of clay, clay pots, he then says that we're, we're squeezed, we're afflicted in every way, but not crushed. It's not hard to crush a clay pot. They, they don't do well in impact. They don't do well in pressure. If you drop them, they're going to bust if you throw something at them, they're going to shatter, um, knock them over, and they're going to break in half, at least half. So it is fundamental to a clay pot that it is readily crushable. But we aren't. There's something not built into our clay potness that describes that is being described here by Paul. And again, it's so we show that our means to living, our power is coming from the Lord, not from within us. So if we're uh, squeezed but not crushed, we're not very clay pot-like. The second, perplexed but not driven to despair. Now that one's not quite as easy to see because despair is an emotional state. And well, clay pots don't have emotional states. But there's still 
when we're put in situations where we would be expected to be fragile, like a clay pot, we are not fragile. Um, this third one, persecuted but not forsaken. The idea of forsaken is, is abandonment. That we, uh, and, and one would expect a clay pot to be abandonable, if that can be a word. That can be a word. We, we are the sort of thing that one would expect to find cast aside on the side of the road or, or used to carry out filth from the household and never used again. We would expect to be prone to be forsaken. Uh, life can be a, a lonely thing. Life can be a series of sequential abandonments. People come and go from our lives all the time. We are not forsaken. Even if we are actively persecuted by those who would do us harm, we, once again, we don't behave like Typical clay pots. We are not forsaken. And then struck down, but not destroyed. You can knock the clay pot off the shelf, and it's a goner. It's going to be in a bunch of fragments on the floor. Uh, they get struck down. They're destroyed. They're done. They are no longer capable of functioning like a pot to hold things. They're no longer even intact. We get struck down, but we don't get destroyed. So each of, these, each of these four pairs drive and are driven by the clay pot metaphor in ways even, even more deep and profound than we had time to talk about on, on Sunday morning. There's also a, a parallel between the two paragraphs in this passage uh, regarding the big why. The big why of our carrying the message of Christ within ourselves. Notice that in verse 11, he says that we are always given over, being given over to death for Jesus' sake. He, he uses a, a very specific preposition uh, through and for the sake of Jesus in verse uh, 11. Then in verse 15, he says, for it is all for your sake. So one could say, well, we, well, which is it in this passage? Which, which of those motivations describes our living out the, the ministry, mission, message of Jesus? Do we do it for the sake of others or do we do it for the Lord? And the message of how these things are paralleled in these passages, the answer to that is yes. Um, we are not in this merely for others as though we're part of some human herd without those, those vertical connections and that, that vertical accountability to the Lord. But neither is it the, the, the case that we're in some sort of, of pristine relationship that is merely me and Jesus, and I don't have to concern myself about anybody else. What we do, we do for Jesus' sake, but also for your sake, the sake of others. And he builds that parallel, I think, very intentionally uh, for Jesus' sake in the paragraph beginning in verse 7, for your sake in the paragraph beginning in verse 13. And then there's one other little word movement I want to show you um, that, that I think is, is, is pretty valuable here. Um, just in verse 15, the last verse of the passage, he says, it is all for your sake. Here it is. So that grace extends to more and more people. It may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. He just, he just uh, sketched a three-link chain that I think is, is uh, just good to see. That his grace extended into the lives of people. If you're attending to this podcast, if you're listening to this right now, you. As grace extends into your life, it should bring out of you a thanksgiving response. As you are once again aware that you are the object of great grace. That is 
becomes the fertile ground out of which arises thanksgiving. If you're not thankful in your, in your thinking about the Lord, you have undervalued the grace you've been given. And if you're, under, if you're undervaluing the grace you've been given, it might be that you think too much of yourself. Because if you think of yourself biblically and honestly, and you know Jesus, you are the object of overwhelming grace. And it shouldn't be that big a step for you to get to profound thanksgiving. And that grace and that thanksgiving is to the glory of God. He should never want for the gratitude of his people because we never want for his grace. It's an amazingly rich paragraph. I hope that you've had a good time walking through it, both in the Lord's Day worship services as well as here on Beyond the Notes. And I hope by now you're liking and sharing and staying with us. We look forward to being with you again next week on Beyond the Notes. Beyond the Notes.